Hello and welcome to Moderate Fantasy Violence, a podcast about pop culture and the world around it. I'm Alistair. And I'm Nick. And this episode, we will be discussing Marvel's new Netflix TV series, Luke Cage, J.J. Abrams' new HBO series, Westworld, British independent sci-fi film, Spaceship, and we'll be finding out what Nick thought about Shane Meadows' revenge thriller, Dead Man's Shoes. But first, Nick... What have you been up to since we last chatted? Well, I, following up from a previous entry in this same segment, I finally finished Twin Peaks. I watched the last two episodes last night, as of this recording. Yeah, that was... got pretty odd at the end there. It didn't go as odd as I kind of expected, though, based on all the build-up. I thought there would be whole episodes where I'd just be staring at a motionless picture of a bush or something. But no, it was... it mostly sort of kept up. It's I'm a pretend 80s soap pretensions. It has um, a reputation for being like very surreal in places. And I think as a show that starts out being a fairly... what you think is a straightforward like murder mystery, it does go to some quite odd places. It does. There's a very odd sequence where a woman appears to turn into a draw handle or something, which... Come to think of it, now that I've seen the rest of the season, isn't really followed up on, which is just odd. It also ends on kind of a cliffhanger, which is exciting, I guess. I mean, it's nice for me, because I've cleverly not watched it until, like, less than a year before we get the new season, so I don't need to wait that long. Must be a pain in the ass for people who have waited 25 years. I think a lot of people have forgotten they ended on a cliffhanger, actually. Does a lot of people mean you? <laughs> <laughs> like, may may include me and a lot of people. But I guess for you, it's very much like... Series 2 just aired, and it's the normal length of time to wait for Series 3, like a year. Something like that. I think I've done a bit of sort of token Googling, and it looks like the the only estimate I've seen for Season 3 is the second quarter of 2017. So yeah, sort of April, May, June next year will be maybe getting the resolution to that cliffhanger, who knows. Sounds good. I would also actually, while I'm talking Twin Peaks, because I did want to do this last time and I kind of annoyingly forgot, while I've been watching Twin Peaks, I've also been listening along, well sort of along, to my viewing with Diane, a new podcast about Twin Peaks, which is tackling one episode a week and uh, talking about the symbolism and the, the magic and the various folklore references and the connotations of it all it's a very it's really good it's also i swear not as sort of stuffy and academic as i've just made it sound it's it's a good chatty fun it's it's at diane podcast on twitter and i think you can probably find it by searching diane or diane twin peaks or something on itunes and yeah if you are re-watching twin peaks or if you just want to you know remind yourself of it getting ready for the new season yeah it's a really good podcast highly recommended mm, great uh, so yeah i've been finishing off the twin peaks alistair what have you been doing Well, I've been at the London Film Festival. It's the 60th BFI London Film Festival. It's currently on in London and I think will still be on when this episode comes out. I've seen four films so far, one of which we'll be discussing in this episode, which is Spaceship. I also saw The 13th, which is a documentary about the rising rate of incarceration of African Americans in America. It kind of traces the history of racist laws going back to Jim Crow and then following that thread through history, seminal events in kind of legal and uh, prison history, uh, bring it up to present day and bring and then talking about things like police shootings, Black Lives Matter. So a really interesting, a uh, lot of detail, political documentary. The second film I saw was Tower, uh, which is a, is a rotoscoped animated documentary about a mass shooting in Texas in the, the 60s, the famous University of Texas Tower shooting. It's quite an early sort of mass shooting in America. And it was quite interesting because it was it was all about the survivors' stories. Okay. What they did is they'd interviewed the survivors or people there at the time, and then they had actors who were the age of the people when the events took place also sort of saying the same thing. So they kind of cut between their young and older selves. And then also they recreated some of the events using the, the actors. And then the whole thing was kind of animated over and then cut together with archive footage. So it was kind of very dreamy, very... So sort of slightly odd. It was a very an interesting way to kind of explore history and partly because they couldn't recreate it and there wasn't a huge amount of sort of first-hand documentary evidence. So I think this is a good way to, to go about telling that story. So that's a really interesting documentary. And then yesterday I saw The Worthy, which is a Emirati film. I think that's how you say it. Well, the filmmaker's from the United Arab Emirates and it was a post-apocalyptic thriller. There's this sort of band of survivors in a sort of future wasteland um, and they encounter this one uh, heavily armed, slightly crazy person who wants to test them to find the worthy, which involves hunting them and killing them in quite violent ways. So the worthy would be one of your less worthy films then, actually not a documentary. No, it's it's not a documentary. It was a quite grim thriller horror movie. But it was really, <laughs> really good. Really good. If it, com- if it comes out, I highly recommend everyone seeing it. It was just, yeah, really tense and violent and stuff. 
Oh, excellent. Anyone famous in it? No one I recognise, apart from they had one of the actors there, and apparently he's like, as well as being an actor, he's also the goalkeeper for one of the top Emirati football clubs. Really? Apparently. <laughs> so the guy's like a sportsman and an actor, so yeah. Is that the triple threat, or is the triple threat singing, acting and dancing? I think the triple threat is singing, acting and dancing. Goalkeeping isn't in it at all. <laughs> no, no, it's like the modern <laughs> pentathlon. <laughs> the pentathlon threat, yeah, no. Pentathlon peril? I don't know where I'm going with that. <laughs> Okay, first up this week, we'll be covering the next of the Marvel Netflix series, going towards the big Defenders team-up, which I think is likely to happen next year, but it's kind of hard to tell. But anyway, this is Luke Cage, which stars Mike Coulter as Luke Cage after his supporting role in last year's Jessica Jones. The show is run by Cheo Hadari Koka and features Luke Cage moving to Harlem after the events of Jessica Jones, where he soon encounters crime and his past coming back to haunt him and all the usual sort of things that happen to superheroes. And yep, it's been on Netflix for a couple of weeks. It's got a lot of attention for being a mainstream action show with a largely black cast. And yep, we've seen the first seven episodes. Alistair, what are you thinking of it? I'm really enjoying it. It's very good. I mean, if you go back to our sort of Daredevil review, I think I was I was a bit... I wasn't as impressed by the second series of Daredevil, but Luke Cage is really good. I'm really into it. I mean, partly it's the the character is just really, really watchable. You know, it's kind of it's a great sense of humour. Performances are top notch. You know, it's just really engaging, you know, show. I mean, I really just like the like how good the writing is. You know, it opens in this barber shop. It's just these group of characters, you know, some work there, some having their hair cut. And they've got a real sort of natural flow of the dialogue. It really strikes you as the way kind of People talk when they're sort of casual and they're relaxed. There are a few moments, particularly the first couple of episodes, I think, are the ones written by Cheo Hadari Koka himself, where he does yeah. really go properly into sort of pulpy, corny dialogue, like when Luke Cage is in the kitchen and the guy from his past, Shades, walks past, and he sort of clenches his fists and goes, Shades! In a sort of... No, no one does that. No one at all. There is some quite pulpy dialogue, you are right. But I think it, it veers between very pulpy and also to kind of social realist level of you know trying to sort of capture how people actually sort of are and behave you know and the characters are very well developed which i think is probably the great strength of the show like they've all got that kind of established backstories they're sort of emotionally complex you don't get a sense of anyone's like just a like a cardboard villain or a cardboard superhero that's kind of just been pushed around by the plot like every event that happens seems to very much you can understand what's come up to there and what aspects of the characters' personalities are sort of driving this event. Like I really like the character of the main villain, uh, Cottonmouth, because he is like a really richly developed villain. And this is a spoiler warning, but yeah, I think as we said, there'll be spoilers for the first seven episodes. At the end of the second episode, the owner of the barber shop, whose name's Pop. Um, he's a sort of surrogate father figure for Luke Cage, is killed in a sort of revenge shooting when one of Cottonmouth's henchmen is trying to get at a um, another criminal who's sort of hiding in the barber shop, so who's not really connected so much to Pop and Luke Cage. It would be so easy to make it Cottonmouth tells his henchmen just basically go down there and, and kill everyone, but Cottonmouth is he he's trying to preserve the peace and a sort of a semblance of honor among thieves. He's not just a bad to the core. He's got principles. You know, you can understand sort of what's motivating him. It's just that his henchmen have got a bit out of control and decide to shoot up the entire shop rather than just killing the person they were sent to get. And it's much more sophisticated. It seems much more believable than a less well written show would have handled that scene. They'd have made it much more straightforward. You know, villain kills the surrogate father figure for the hero which spurs the hero into action but... the surrogate father figure dying is definitely a pretty That's well trope, trodden yeah. bit of road yeah but i think they approach it in a, in a sort of different way and that it's he's not just killed just for the sake of it the events that are set in motion that lead to this happening are done in a believable way yeah in terms of Cottonmouth. A bit conflicted for him, because on the one hand, I think he's very well played by the actor Maya Sharla Ali. His maniacal laugh during moments of sort of peak villainous enjoyment is just just fun. I just Yeah, he's very, very watchable. On the other hand, compared to his sort of Netflix predecessors like David Tennant's Purple Man and Vincent D'Onofrio's Kingpin. I know you don't love the Kingpin as much as I love the Kingpin, but still, I feel like he came across as a bit of a generic gangster. Albeit a quite well-acted and entertaining one, so I don't know how much I'm really bothered by that, but I don't think he stuck out a mile off quite as much as the others did he's certainly not as good as david tennant in jessica jones but he was absolutely amazing in that part i mean just kind of it was just perfectly written and perfectly cast so that's a very very high bar to meet so i don't think it's a particularly negative comment to say he's not like kind of the greatest villain that sort of netflix tv has had 
so far because it's a high bar for him to meet that David Tennant Kilgrave character but I think he does really good and it's, he, there's certainly much more to his character than just being a gangster who's now got a club and some sort of political respect and some money a lot of it's again sort of quite pulpy isn't it it's sort of the gangster with a moral code sort of thing it makes him not just a bohaha villain but on the other hand it is quite a sort of trope in itself yeah I mean it's interesting because it's sort of going for this crime pulp thing in a much more straightforward way than the other Netflix shows have. The other Netflix shows have had this sort of dark tone, but generally things get quite silly quite quickly. It particularly, where, you know, in Jessica Jones, there's the mind control man. In Daredevil, there was the hand. So this is, in some ways, a hard thing to state categorically, because I do still think it's possible that it could go full comic. But yeah, I'm interested by the fact that they seem so far to be committing for a lot longer to this, it's a relatively sedate neighbourhood drama, apart from Luke Cage's own superpowers, which are quite low-key, you know, he's not firing energy blasts out of his eyes or anything, he's just this sort of unpunchable tank man. Yeah, he's str- he's super strong, and he's basically his skin is invulnerable, so all so far, he's sort of, he's bulletproof. Yeah, I quite like the style of the fight scenes, the way it's just sort of Luke Cage, strolling along quite sedately whilst everything just bounces off him and the way yeah and the way he just sort of does these small hand movements and sends things flying across the room whilst making sort of laconic one-liners it's just it's just quite entertaining to watch yeah that is very much the best bit of the show when that sort of stuff happens like i really like in the third episode when um he has to break into what they call fort knox which is cottonmouth safe house where he's got all of his sort of illegal gotten gains is stashed yeah and luke cage just rips the door off a car and then kind of marches through the base just using this as a shield which bullets just bounce off and then kind of bashing people in the head with the car door and just kind of marches way through about 30 henchmen to steal all the cottonmouth's money it's just it's just such a brilliantly entertaining action scene yeah in terms of action that's probably been the highlight so far though i did enjoy the um i think the fight in the gym in the last episode that i watched yeah that was very good real sense of humor i like it when um so the gangsters open fire at luke cage and all the bullets Let's just bounce off him and he just looks down and goes i'm getting real sick of having to buy new clothes yeah i think that bit was in a trailer actually and fair enough it's a really good bit yeah it's a very good line i think mike Coulter as luke cage i think has a lot of sort of low-key charisma i mean he was really good in jessica jones as well his scenes were all often the highlight of episodes of that and yeah it's odd i, th- I think i sometimes feel like his actual acting is a bit stiff compared to some of the other actors who are a lot more sort of natural and in full flow but because he's playing this sort of quite stoic determined guy it's sort of hard to tell if that's you know a bug or a feature as we say. The character doesn't have a very wide range, which is, means it's hard for the actor to show off his range. Kind of like Mike in Breaking Bad. Yeah. Who, yeah, really just kind of has one kind of emotional state. I think he goes into it over the course of the show. I found him a lot more natural and watchable by about episode five or six than he was at the very start. In fact, to be honest, the whole show really did grow on me quite quite slowly at first. In the beginning, I was a bit sort of, okay, we have finally reached a point with these Netflix shows where the, the plot has just reached glacial pace. But I think by about episode seven or so, I'm not sure whether it speeded up or if I just got into the, the groove of it and started it and just enjoyed it more. I think the fact they got the origin out of the way helps and that's always become a, a crucial watermark to pass on your superhero series. Have we got the origin out of the way? It'll probably get better once we've done that. Yeah, I think that's, that's a very good point. I think the third and fourth episodes, oh sorry, the first four episodes were a sort of mini origin arc, even though they did it out of order, as the Netflix shows always seem to do for some reason. Start with Hero, flashback later. I guess possibly to avoid the trope of having to trudge through the origin first. But anyway, yeah, the first three episodes did sort of feel like an origin in that, you know, you had how he got his powers and the death of the father figure, albeit the other way around, but still. Which, yeah, which spurs him into motion. It's a very much a reluctant hero storyline in that it starts with Luke Cage, he's on the run because of his past and he's been in, sort of in prison His wife's died, he's had a lot of pain, and he's just trying to sort of hide out and live a normal life working in this barber shop. And then obviously he encounters this villain, one thing leads to another, the sort of surrogate father figure, barbershop owner is killed, and this sparks him into action. And then, you know, kind of the plot goes in there. It is a well-trodden, reluctant hero storyline. I think it's just the degree of humour and pizzazz yeah, that the show has is what makes it work. Well, yeah, but even during the first few episodes, I was a bit sort of, I feel like more could be happening here. The sort of the look and the sound, I think, really carried it a lot of the way, you know. It always had this nice orangey, yellowy Harlem sunrise palette going on, which I always quite enjoyed. So lots of gold and brown is used, especially at the opening credit sequence, I think, is just a beautiful combination of sort of the stylized image of kind of Luke Cage himself intercut with sort of shots of sort of landmarks around Harlem and with you know it's a great sort of soundtrack yeah I mean the soundtrack's great as well I mean they love a sort of musical intercut montage in this show don't they like I think in not every episode but damn near every episode there's a bit where someone does a song in Cottonmouth's club and it intercuts to someone getting fucked up yeah and those scenes are usually really really good oh yeah a lot of this show is kind of about 
the sort of the culture of Harlem and black culture and the fact that, you know, the villain owns a club and he says an African American hasn't achieved anything like this in Harlem before, this kind of creating this cultural hub and sort of style icon. You know, they talk a lot about, like they mentioned the Harlem Renaissance a lot. You kind of the background to Luke Cage is what they call this new Harlem Renaissance in that Harlem is becoming a vibrant cultural hotbed again, partly because of, you know, Cottonmouth and his club and, and like say the music we talked about. And they mentioned things like there's like street poets and stuff are discussed at various points and various figures from the history of African Americans in America and the sort of civil rights movement. Like they mentioned like Christmas Attics, Martin Luther King, Malcolm X. So someone actually put together a, a Luke Cage reading list, which we can link to in the show notes. It's really worth looking at if you really want to kind of dig more into the, all the stuff, all the music and kind of writers they reference. I'd always rather have a playlist, to be honest. There's some great music on this show. I think they are actually releasing the soundtrack. I believe they're actually releasing a vinyl version of the soundtrack as well. I mean, the fact that it's it has this focus on black culture gives it, you know, it's quite aside from, you know, the, the diversity, which is a good thing in itself. In a world where a new superhero show debuts basically every 20 minutes and the fact that this one has a distinct look and feel and you know even a reason to exist is good i think that's going to become increasingly important as there are just more and more of the fuckers yeah no exactly this one is feels fresh and original like it's doing something new like about i don't know 80 percent of the cast must be african-american you know the only major non-african-american there's um there's a few puerto rican characters and they're only, I think I only think of one white character, which is the, the sort of cop stroke love interest for Luke Cage. Her partner is the only white character I can think of the show. He's certainly the only one who has a particularly major role, yeah. Or like a speaking part, yeah. Because if it's a show that's set in Harlem, it should represent, you know, what Harlem looks like. And I think this is a very good representation of Harlem. Like, they clearly shot it, a lot of the stuff on location. They've got the very iconic brownstone townhouses sort of lining every road. They talk about kind of the, some of the social problems, how there's great wealth, one of the main characters... The sort of the cousin of Cottonmouth is like a, a councilwoman who's clearly well educated, very wealthy, but you know, stacked up against this kind of enormous wealth is poverty and stuff. You know, a lot of one of the plot lines involves like sort of construction of like new housing projects, I guess, to provide more affordable housing, and which is a huge problem in in New York, especially for African Americans who tend to be poorer. So I think they really are, you know, trying to get across some of the social and economic issues that are affecting kind of Harlem as well as kind of representing it accurately. Yeah, and a lot has been made of the cultural importance of a bulletproof black man in a hoodie in the aftermath of the recent range of shootings and stuff. Yeah. Again, it does help make this seem very relevant and important and of its time. I mean, I'm not, you know, obviously not deeply embedded in black culture, so I've no idea if Luke Cage is going to become a major icon in that area, but I imagine it probably has the potential to. I think it's very prescient for this moment. Like you say, yeah, we'll have to wait and see if this becomes, you know, one of the things that's remembered from this kind of moment in politics but i think luke cage is like all art forms especially great art forms it's it's feeding off the kind of the the zeitgeist and the ideas and important debates of the time but also feeding into them so it's clearly influenced by the problems we had with like police shootings and also poverty and race especially in in new york but it's also got something to say about these that may become important in the future the other thing is also because it's an, a superhero action-based netflix show it's taking these sort of issues things to a wider audience like we started this episode by talking about the 13th a hard-hitting documentary about the rate of incarcerations of african americans in america and it's very interesting covers a lot of points but it's only really going to be watched by people who are already interested in that subject and has some sympathy for those political views what a show like luke cage does is because of this superhero marvel you know action element it appeals to a much wider maybe more agnostic audience but it exposes people to new ideas different characters so it, well yeah but if the marvel cinematic well whatever whatever it is now the marvel tv film mega franchise empire can serve a good purpose beyond just making people watch and consume more stuff it is i guess going you need to watch this because it's part of the defenders wing of the cinematic franchise and it'll also bring certain issues to the forefront you know it's actually using this sort of interconnectedness of it to serve some sort of purpose. Yeah, but also just exposing people to different cultures and different like different music, literature, sort of environments, issues that affect other people's lives. It's that kind of broadening people's horizons will make you more sympathetic and maybe more interested in what life is like in places that you may not have really thought about or considered. So that's what kind of great art can kind of open your mind in that way, which is one of the things I really like about this show. Tracking back a few units, you've mentioned or at least skipped over mentioning uh, Misty Knight, the police character played by Simone Missick. Yeah, she's very good. Yeah, she's probably the breakout character here aside from Luke Cage himself. She's 
inserts it's a lot of sort of watchability and goodness into what could have been a quite sort of thankless role the sort of the cop who has her job sort of done for her by Luke Cage jogs along just after he's finished to go you shouldn't be doing this you're a bad vigilante and yeah she could be a really boring voice of authority nagging character but she's no she's really really watchable and likable yeah very good and the, the crime plot is and everything is very interesting how it's put together the um I like how the you know there's a power struggle within the sort of villain camp between Cottonmouth and his cousin there are are times when even though from Luke Cage's point of view they seem like this all-powerful villainous force that's united against him but from the other side of the fence you can see there's problems and I know there's different factions. If you're going to do this sort of the Netflix structure which seems to be for all these the sort of Defenders franchise shows one story split over 13 episodes rather than trying to do anything massively episodic which I still think they should do by the way I still actually think they should actually make an episodic TV show rather than a 13 part movie. But anyway, there has to be this this level of complexity. There has to be this things you can actually advance. It can't just be, well, based on Jessica Jones, I guess it could be, but it's better if there's some flexibility in what the villain is or what the plot is or what or it has actually visible different phases. The kind of the plot, I think, is kind of broken down into sort of there's two halves. Like, we're halfway through, pretty much exactly. And at the end of episode seven, you, the co- plot's kind of reached a certain point and we're going to be seeing something different maybe from the second half. It is, it is, yeah, I mean, to be fair, and almost contradicts what I just said. Sorry, me. It does potentially look like the second half could be a dramatically different feel to the first half. I don't know, but I'm sort of kind of hoping it might be, to be honest, because I do think, as I say, that making these things a bit more episodic and having them move more in tangible phases would be good. Like, I quite liked that Daredevil Season 2 had a sort of two or three visible phases. It, like, did the Punisher, and then it, which was good, and then it did the Hand, which wasn't, you know different things being tried and jessica jones is kind of divides roughly i think into two halves like the first half is when they're trying to apprehend Kilgrave and prove to the world that he exists the second half they realize that yeah, that's too risky they're just trying to kill him i don't know i don't know if the distinction was that stark really was it that just that didn't really feel like distinct storylines that just felt like one storyline which shifted i guess you're right they were just they were different phases of the same storyline which is what we're probably going to get from Luke Cage again, different phases of the same storyline. But there is a yeah. kind of, I think it clearly is an embarkation point around episode six, episode seven, where the plot is kind of changing gears and shifting directions a bit. And yes, um, yeah, and obviously I, I suspect by the time this comes out, which will be a good two weeks after it's first aired, I imagine a lot of you will have seen the ending. Hell, by then we might have seen the ending. One of my favourite bits actually is there's like, is all the flashbacks to like sort of the, the 70s and 80s. Like um, there's a great one where they fill in uh, Cottonmouth's backstory. I think that was episode six. Okay, I have a response to what Alistair just said, but just for the record, as we've said, there is a big sort of twist plot move at the end of episode seven, and in order to make this next point, I'm going to have to spoil it. So get a nice stress. If you haven't seen Luke Cage episode seven and you think you might want to, I don't know, I suspect we... I don't know how many more points we've got left, but you may want to use our show notes and cut to the beginning of the next segment, to be honest. Okay? Ready? Owen? Okay, so yeah, when the Cottonmouth flashback started up and he started suddenly getting angsty about his lost past as a pianist, he did then die, like, three scenes later. It was a sort of a fairly classic example of the old, again, trope of character suddenly gains new levels of depth and sympathy and then dies. Yeah, to provoke an emotional reaction from the audience rather than one of just, wait, the villain's dead. Well, well, yeah, slightly amp up the tragedy or at least the empathy around their death. Yeah, I mean, it was a really good scene and yeah, as I say, the... Well, I might as well just follow on the whole lot now. What we were talking about a few seconds ago about different phases, obviously the, ne- the second phase of the show will be his cousin Mariah as the main villain. Because they've sort of been a bit sparing in how they've used her, I actually don't know exactly what that's going to feel like, which is, you know, interesting and could be different. Also, I like that because it brought in the character of Pop when he was younger and wasn't this kind of quite benign fatherly figure who just wanted to run a barber shop because he used to be a gangster as well. So in the 80s, 70s, 80s flashback bit, you see that, yeah, he was he was an unpleasant gangster. I mean, they call him, his nickname is Pop. They call him Snap, Crackle and Pop. They're the sounds that his fists make when he was hitting someone. <laughs> <laughs> that seemed like quite hard work. <laughs> but it does make him sound much more unpleasant than the kind of lovely old sort of father figure ru- just quietly running a barbershop and dispensing wisdom. I know, it just, it, just, it just seemed like quite hard work considering that, yeah, he's a, he's a father figure, therefore his name's Pop. Uh, but he's also a fist popper. I don't know, anyway. Carry on. <laughs> it is, yeah, it is a possibly a bit of a stretch at that point. Okay, and next up we're going to talk about Westworld, which HBO have just debuted, which I guess is being lined up to fill the Game of Thrones shaped gap in their schedule that will be coming up pretty soon. It's a sci fi series set in a future of some kind where people amuse themselves by visiting a strange western enclosure populated by 
robot Western people, which are very elaborately made and programmed to seem entirely human and live independently and so on. Uh, it's from Jonathan Nolan, who's been involved in a range of things. I know mostly from person of interest, I think. And J.J. Abrams, who has been involved in so many things, it's hard to know where to start. But yeah, it's also based on an old movie, which, of course, because it's a movie I haven't seen. So we've seen the pilot episode of Westworld. Alistair, what did you think? Well, my first point on my list of notes is pretentious worthiness aimed at pseudo-intellectuals. So I think that kind of sums it up. Not a fan? No, I I mean, it wasn't it wasn't terrible, but it had lots of, you know, pretentious long discussions about the nature of humanity and evolution delivered by I don't know, Anthony Hopkins at times, which I kind of, I don't know, it was just, what do these add to the plot? And like, other than just slightly pretentious dribble, just to kind of, I don't know, make it seem like it's trying to say something like deep and profound it had a terrible exposition heavy voiceover in that the first at least half of the episode was pretty much all narrated including that like kind of major plot events would happen and then they'd just be kind of explained by this bizarre voice of god narration that i just really wanted to fuck off when this voiceover wasn't just explaining the plot that we just seen it was then making more pretentious statements about human existence or something like that i don't know it seemed to me this seemed to embody some of like the worst aspects of the kind of nolan dark knight movies in that it kind of takes something that's a bit ridiculous to be honest and seems to be really insistent this says something really profound and important about the human experience and we're going to convey that by having characters sit there and talk in sort of cod philosophy for a bit to make it sound clever yeah i didn't hate it as much as you did but my first note is indeed that it's very very dry i mean i i i suspect it's a bit sort of cheap and playing into the media narrative to go straight into comparing this to Game of Thrones, but I'm going to do that anyway. Like, Game of Thrones uses a lot of sort of characterisation and jokes and, like, clear sense of events to get people into its sort of otherwise quite dry fantasy politics story. Westworld, there's not really that much attempt to hook you into the characters or entertain you with jokes or, with the exception of a couple of scenes at the end, really give you any major plot moves to get your teeth into. It's just fairly dry introduction of the concept there's a few vaguely intriguing mysteries i do kind of want to know what's up with that cowboy who's running around shooting people and scalping them i assume that's going somewhere the ed harris character yeah the speechifying was just about on the acceptable end i liked the way they sort of vaguely focused on the practical aspects of trying to make these replica humans work and you know the way they didn't waste their time doing a pullback on what was happening like they, they started off with that vaguely sympathetic guy who i think you were meant to think was one of the guests but turned out to be one of the replicants yeah they had sidsy babette nudson from borgen as one of the main bureaucrat management people she was great in that and she was pretty good here but yeah it's it felt weirdly like about 17 other things like various things i've seen like if you combine the the sort of the cowboy hell sequence from preacher with dollhouse and then sort of hit it with a hammer a few times i've roughly got westworld i guess plus maybe the original movie westworld but obviously i haven't seen that i haven't seen the original film either i think you're right with saying this first episode was quite all over the place there really wasn't much plot which i think was deliberate they just for the first episode they wanted to establish the characters and the setting and it is an unusual setting in that it's got these kind of two aspects to it the kind of futuristic company that's administering this theme park full of western robots and the plot in the theme park itself with the sort of the robots it's done to give you empathy for these robots in that they kind of they live the same day over and over in this theme park and the guests which are us can kind of go into the theme park get involved in the stories that are told in this day but also they can't be heard in any way by the hosts the robots and they can do anything they like to them so you like kill them and other horrible things scalp them as you just said and obviously the whole thing is set up to make you feel sympathetic for these robots which is you know a difficult sell and they kind of do a good job of establishing that and establishing the plot partly the way this sympathy is built for the robots is throwing in what I felt was a sort of needless rape scene in sort of about halfway through the first uh, episode. That was, I guess it was certainly unpleasant to watch, but also I felt... Well, well, thankfully, it's a sort of off-camera implied rape scene rather than an actual on-screen rape scene, but it's still pretty grim, yeah. Yeah, I don't know. And I don't know how much that necessarily contributed to the plot, um, other than just it didn't, like, trying to make the thing seem, the whole show seem darker and edgier. The I think the principal villain seems to be... Uh, it's played by Ed Harris, who's a cowboy dressed all in black, who's one of the guests. He says he's been coming to the park for 30 years, and I think he just pretty much goes there just because he likes to torture and sort of make these uh, these robots suffer. But it's, it's sort of impl- implied that he's looking for something or trying to 
get to or uncover something. Yeah, particularly in his last couple of scenes. Yeah, no, there's yeah, there's more to it than that, but I think there's an element of this kind of these robots are forced to relive this day over and over and over. When part of Ed Harris's quest is to horribly torture and kill them, and you know that kind of builds sympathy for the hosts. It was quite a good scene, you know, when there's Ed Harris confronts the sort of hero type host who like as you said you're supposed to think he's a guest you find out he's a host and then there's a bit when he's trying to protect the kind of the, the hero is trying to protect this woman who the ed harris guy wants to rape and then he finds out he can't hurt um ed harris because ed harris is a guest and the hero is is a host and that's quite a good moment of if it wasn't ruined by the ridiculous voiceover explaining this to you as you watch it yeah, I quite like a bit of sort of really on the nose, high concept sci-fi, and but you know it's just one massive concept and people moving around within it. And yeah, a bit more characters and humanity would have been nice, as you say. A lot of the characters who did exist, but either the robots who you know you do feel sorry for as these sort of victim muppets, but it's hard to actually get in their head and relate to them because they're so inhuman. Yeah, and the people who are all, as you say, sort of. By necessity, I guess, sort of quite cynical-ish scientists delivering speeches about the human condition. Except for the, there's one vaguely sympathetic scientist, but he's sympathetic in a sort of quite quiet, careful way. So he doesn't really... He's not massively watchable, I guess. He's not what you call an entertaining character. And obviously they're going for this sort of deep, ponderous thing. Maybe they, maybe they felt like having a Tyrion Lannister character would be a bit much, but I did kind of come away feeling like it could probably have used one. Yeah, I would definitely agree with that, in that you can have so much sort of talk about the sort of the deeper meaning of all this, but there needs to be some kind of entertainment value. Yeah, I mean, there was one bit which I genuinely really enjoyed, which was the saloon attack towards the end of the episode, while um, the Sid Zipa Bet Knudsen character and the writer both watched it, and he was waiting for the cowboy to deliver his big speech, and inevitably the cowboy got blown away just before he could deliver it. I did laugh out loud, that was a good scene, again, because they've sort of built up to it with the characters, and then Sid Zipa Bet Knudsen got to patronise the shit out of the writer because he didn't get to hear his big speech. Yeah, I'd agree with you. That was that was a good scene. I mean, it wasn't, you know, it had some good good aspects to it. I thought it was beautifully shot. Like, they really got the sort of cinema level cinematography. It just looked, you know, really just looked fantastic. Like, all the shots of kind of the Wild West terrain, this American wilderness, very iconic, you know, you know, captured by so many great filmmakers over the years, you know, from John Ford all the way up to, you know, to Westworld and or well, the original Westworld as well. It looked stunningly beautiful and the kind of the town and everything. And the, there's some great bits when one of the, well, two of the, the hosts kind of ride out on their horses out into the wilderness and it's just it's just beautifully captured. And also the other plot line, the kind of futuristic HQ of the Westworld Corporation, I thought was really, you know, really well done. It was a kind of like a sinister version of an Apple store. I think um, I think I read that actually in a review. I read a bit, so that may, that's not my witticism. Yeah, you know, everything was kind of mirrors and glass and very sterile and cold. In the realization of the Westworld HQ, they managed to get the kind of the perfect combination of it looking very corporate, very trendy, but also very sinister. So it was, yeah, it's kind of like imagine if uh, a Batman villain lived in an Apple store. <laughs> Yeah, it does look massively amazing and expensive. I mean, I'm kind of curious whether that means it'll need a fairly decent chunk of ratings to justify keeping it going. I mean, I've never been entirely sure what HBO's relationship to ratings is. I think one of the huge success of Game of Thrones is that people take out HBO subscriptions just to watch Game of Thrones. Yeah. And yeah, there's a few other shows like that probably happened in the past, like The Wire or Soprano, some other popular stuff on HBO. But I don't think anything's ever been as successful as Game of Thrones. Certainly in motivating people to shell out money for one particular channel i know in the uk sky atlantic was pretty much heavily marketed as you can watch game of thrones like as soon as it's available it's basically the uk home of hbo or something and also mad men apparently but yeah so i think that's how they evaluate you know if it drives people specifically to buy hbo subscriptions which does maybe wonder how successful it's going to be because it's it's a it's really dry science fiction i don't know dry fire Dry sci-fi? Dry fi Yeah. And I don't know. I don't really... quite Outside of whether it's good or not, I don't know if it's something that's going to go wide. You know, I don't know if it's going to take sci-fi to the people in the same way that Game of Thrones has successfully taken fantasy to the people. It depends how it goes. I mean, I remember watching the first episode of Game of Thrones and kind of being a bit overwhelmed by how many characters they were and all the different settings and everything that was going on, even as someone who, you know, watches a lot of sci-fi fantasy TV and reads a lot of novels. But, you know, the first episode had some great moments, like, you know, it ends with Bran being thrown from the tower and stuff. There's enough to keep you going, whereas Westworld, although I, the, I did feel a bit overwhelmed by the 
first episode and there were definitely moments when I was a bit confused about you know what's actually going on it, which is not great from a first episode from someone from a veteran TV watcher to basically be a bit confused I don't know I think I think as you say first episodes are things they do often have that vague sense of what exactly is going on who are these people again I mean as you yeah. say it was the same with Game of Thrones wasn't it yeah and like, it took me ages to get my head around all the minor characters in Game of Thrones like you know Venerys and Littlefinger and all you know to, to kind of mesh it all together compared to Game of Thrones this is like comparatively normal no that's true but with Westworld I think so the first episode they've established the concept and they've established the characters we didn't really get much plot to be honest and we didn't really get much character progression or even really really understanding of what kind of conflicts would arise in these characters aside from some of the very obvious ones whether or not this will be a success to any degree very much I think depends on the next few episodes it's kind of hard to judge from the first episode I think uh, HBO are really banking on this been a success or we want it to be a success especially if game of thrones years are numbered they do want another flagship show to replace it they certainly spared no expense one of the things i really liked about this is uh the cast was very good really good sort of list of actors i really like mainly from films we've mentioned ed harris anthony hopkins plays the the kind of creator of the park and sort of godfather of all the robots although he has some horribly pretentious dialogue even rachel wood is very good as one of the sort of main hosts at least uh, the main sort of female protagonist. She's the kind of long-suffering host who lives the same day over and over where she seems to get uh, raped and murdered by Ed Harris. That only happened once, didn't it? I don't, I don't think the idea is that happens at the end of every single day, but I might be wrong. I don't think every single day, but it does happen a lot. There's a bit when Ed Harris is like, you don't remember me, and it's very much implied that he's done this before, and he keeps talking about, just before he rapes her, he talks about how he, the way he likes her and the way he likes her when she fights and stuff, and it's it's really kind of, I don't know, veering into the kind of rape culture area that I'm really not comfortable with, to be honest. Uh, also, in terms of great acting, Jeffrey Wright, who was uh, one of the sort of people working on the robots, who people may remember from Source Code and other films. He's very good, and he's very good in this film. I mean, this is exactly the sort of story that's normally a movie, isn't it? Because it feels like it sort of has to go, like, one way. The park boils over, the robots rebel somehow, there's some sort of resolution at the end. Yeah, I can imagine that is where it's going. I'm curious whether that they're going to drag that development out over five years of TV or whether the idea is that this is the plot for the first season and then they're going to have to do something radically different in season two. I kind of hope that's what they're doing because if so, I'm curious exactly how they'll take it beyond that. Yeah, that might be one of the ways that if they do the kind of the film plot in the first series, the second series they've got to kind of make up a plot from nothing and that's when it could really come off the rails. It could or it could be... Good. I don't know. I'd, I'd, I'm interested to see what they do with a second season. Whether they'll get one, I don't know. Because as I say, this is quite expensive, and I'm not that confident how widely popular it can be. But I'm, I'll probably keep watching it just to see what they actually do once they've gone beyond the obvious plot. Yeah. Are you going to keep watching it then? That's probably the big test of these things, isn't it? Well, it depends what else is on TV, and also <laughs> it depends on whether we make the conscious decision to revisit it. I mean, I would be interested to see where it goes, but my hopes aren't high. Other than the kind of the the rapey stuff that I did think was a bit much. I really disliked the ponderous pretentiousness of it. The, like I say, summing up the worst aspects of the Dark Knight films and some, especially superhero movies, mainly DC superhero movies, in that they seem to be convinced that this, like, basically quite silly story in which, like, a man dressed up as a bat beats up a clown apparently is a searing insight into the human condition that's on the same level as like Camus or Sartre Batman v Superman really did a number on you didn't it did not like that film <laughs> but not that you have to read very very worthy kind of you know books written by French philosophers to make interesting points about the human condition I mean like you know I think Luke Cage makes some very interesting points about the human condition in a subtle an interesting and entertaining way. Bashing your audience over the head with this is deep, this is dark, this is important is just make, really highlights the way that it's kind of really quite clunky, pretentious and actually quite shallow at times. It is enjoyably different from a lot of the current stuff that's on and that's big. The sort of distant robotic sci-fi. You know, there's not actually that much of that in mainstream culture at the moment. It doesn't really seem to be in. A lot of stuff is either fantasy because everyone wants to be Game of Thrones or sort of contemporary urban fantasy superhero stuff because obviously everyone wants to be Marvel. <laughs> Next up, we'll be discussing Spaceship, an independent British film, which we saw at the London Film Festival. It's directed by Alex Taylor and centres around a group of teenagers and their belief that one of their friends may have been abducted by aliens. It's a quite 
abstract, slightly surreal, you know, low key film about sort of what it's like to be a teenager and especially teenagers who maybe feel a bit different or a bit isolated from mainstream society. It's quite an unusual film. I really liked it. It's very different to a lot of stuff that we normally cover. Nick, what were your thoughts? A bit like Stranger Things, only British and teenagers instead of kids and sort of weirder. So even Stranger Things, I guess. I don't know. That's a good definition. (laughs) Even Stranger Things. Yeah, I mean, as somebody who's just finished watching Twin Peaks, I did get a bit of a Twin Peaks vibe from it the sort of undercurrents of weirdness without ever really going in detail about the mechanics of the weirdness and just sort of engaging with it because i mean i know you described it as a sci-fi film in your description like way up at the top of the podcast but obviously there's a possible sci-fi undercurrent but it's never made explicit it's really mostly i was gonna say it's mostly about the characters but honestly i think it's mostly about the sort of weird intercutting to be honest i mean it would be a lie to say there's no plot because there is a plot it's actually to be honest a plot you could summarize fairly briefly as i think we now have as someone who I must admit, because I'm a subhuman scum, probably like my entertainment a bit more plot-driven. Like, Twin Peaks, although it's weird, is also very plot-driven. The murder mystery is always there, despite the sort of fringe of weirdness that sort of looms there for the beginning and slowly becomes more and more prominent. Whereas this sort of starts weird and kind of stays weird, and the plot is always quite thin. Yeah, it's definitely what maybe what I describe as, well, is it a mood piece or a character piece, in that it's the plot is a basic structure for the, the substance of the film to kind of fit around there's quite straightforward plot in that there's there's a teenager called lucidia her mum's died her dad who's is an archaeologist he's spending a lot of time working on this dig that's been exposed by military training not far from uh, from where they live and she i guess she feels a bit sort of isolated and a bit lonely and then she also kind of thinks that her mum may have run off or been abducted or something rather than killed herself and then she sort of disappears into these sort of bizarre multicolored light sort of thing and you're not really sure what's going on if it's this if she's been abducted by aliens or a spaceship or not and her friends look for her but in a sort of half-hearted way they more just sit around and talk about her and what it means that she's been abducted is that what i mean by the british version of stranger things in america when your friend disappears you go on a lengthy quest to rescue them in britain when your friend disappears you sort of poke around their house a bit and then just sit around going oh man imagine if they've gone to see unicorns (laughs) Yeah, it was. Yeah, it was very much that. But I think it really it got across being a teenager very well. Teenagers just kind of spending all their time lying around, not really doing much, talking a lot in some sort of like unfocused ways about sort of quite a lot of abstract ideas. You know, young people, you know, who are awoken into the world and are now trying to like piece together its complexity and find out their place in it. I did really like that it was a film about teenagers being teenagers that wasn't just teenagers are hopped up on drugs, sex and alcohol all the time. Even though there were some like, you know, teenagers experimenting with drugs and, and, you know, sex and things like that. It was, I think, it was a kind of a thing, a very realistic portrayal of teenagers. I mean, my teenage experience wasn't much like these teenagers because they seem to, they're very much in a sort of cyber goth, uh, sort of alternative subculture and they dress in a way kind of, that's a bit punk, a bit gothy, a bit cyber goth. They're no, they're very much like sort of alternative teenagers. But even though my teenage years, I wasn't in that subculture, but I could really relate to them as teenage characters because they did kind of the same things we did in that kind of just wandered around aimlessly for no reason, just sat around and talked aimlessly, just trying to figure out the world. It- yeah, I quite liked how they did just sort of confront straight on the teenagers are dicks problem by just having the teenagers be dicks. Yeah. Rather than making them weirdly, unrealistically driven and virtuous or just having them be dicks in a way that was judged and annoying they were a bit self-involved and lazy because that's just the way they are and you had the dad in there to actually you know do the sort of i'm genuinely looking for my child because that's what an adult would do right? while a teenager just sort of sat around yeah which i quite enjoyed i mean, I mean the alice character especially played by Tallulah rose hayden was properly uh, dislikable but in a sort of quite entertaining way because she's a teenager rather than because she's a terrible person yeah she's quite relatable as people I knew from being a teenager in that she was the one who kind of, she seemed to have figured herself out a bit more than the others and figured the world out a bit more, at least seemed to have. So she kind of was very much like the dominant one in the group because she kind of knew a bit more and was a bit more of a leader where the others were kind of still in that kind of slightly confused, little things out teenage way. So they follow the one who is the one who seems to have it all figured out, even though Alice doesn't seem to be particularly interested in other people. I think, I don't know, it did feel sometimes like a bit more of a sort of loose selection of moments. And sometimes, you know, the moments would be a bit sort of, I don't know, occasionally there would be several minutes of pass, I'd be sort of not entirely sure why I'm seeing this or what relevance this has. There was a few moments of sort of squaddies talking, which were kind of funny in a sort of 
gentle way, but it's just a bit, you haven't really conveyed the point of this to me. Yeah, I guess it was kind of build out the world a bit more, like, because there is kind of, they live in a small barracks town adjacent to like an army training centre. So there were these kind of two squaddies, but they didn't really interact with other characters. I guess he was just trying to show this is what the teenagers in this town are like. There's some that are kind of in this alternative gothy subculture, seem a bit alienated from everyone else. And there are some who are like going into the army and seem kind of very focused on that. And there was lots of shots of just kind of like schools and stuff and kids waiting for buses and things who kind of just show that the mainstream of youth life continues despite the fact that these characters live in this slightly separate bubble. Yeah, I mean, the thing with this this sort of film and this sort of style it's very it, it does work very well for the sort of the big emotional peaks i mean like the last half hour 20 minutes of this film was easily the best bit when they sort of went to a rave and then the plot sort of started to come together a bit more and yeah and the music was all really good as well so that really helped build towards that so yeah the sort of the sort of flashes of stuff and big sort of glowing lights and even though i've been a bit sort of on and off a bit throughout the film i still really felt the ending because it was really well done I kind of like the ambiguity of it. Yeah, contrarily, I'm actually, even though I've said I'd have liked a more focused plot a few minutes ago, I actually didn't mind the ambiguity at the end. I don't think it actually mattered that much whether she'd really been abducted or not. It's quite an abstract film, and I do like, you know, as anyone who knows me or has even listened to this podcast, you know, I kind of like abstract art and abstract filmmaking. You know, we talked about how the sort of abstract nature of the Big Lebowski is used to create comedy and the abstract nature of the Neon Demon is used to kind of unsettle you and put you out of your comfort zone, ready for the kind of the horror movements. This was kind of, even though it was less plot driven than both of those films, it definitely had these kind of sort of very abstract moments when I think partly it was done much like the Neon Demon to kind of articulate the inner sense of the character. You're trying to get across what the characters are feeling. And obviously being a teenager, there's all these like extreme emotions and they're confusing and they're sort of very powerful and sometimes almost seems like completely control you. And we they kind of got that across very well. Yeah, I think it used the kind of slightly abstract, unusual nature of filmmaking, sort of unusual self to kind of to portray the emotional states of the characters quite well. I quite liked what the director Alex Taylor said in the Q&A after about, you know, his use of music and how music's incredibly important to you when you're that age and like you choose these songs that seem to be, you know, explicitly about you and your experience and it's shape how you feel and and it'll always sort of evoke that feeling in you yeah it was very good it was mainly sort of folky acoustic music the fact that i like that style of music probably helps i'm not gonna lie it was interesting that that's the kind of music they had whereas the characters were very much in us belong to this what i thought was represented like a sort of cyber goth subculture although there's one character who's clearly really into unicorns it's possibly you know a slightly different subculture <laughs> i'm not an expert in unusual unicorns. teenage yes. subcultures but but I really like the fact the characters were shown as being like that because even though that my teenage experience wasn't like that, when I got to university, that was a subculture that I did get involved with and I met lots of people who were even like really into that subculture. And I could kind of see in those people I knew the sort of what they may have been like as a teenager may have been similar to some of the characters in Spaceship, which is one of the things that kind of made it feel realistic. And also I think it's a really interesting subculture that generally gets overlooked especially when teenagers are portrayed they tend to you know if you have alternative teenagers on screen they usually i know they're punks or something like that or but and you know punks are great subculture as well and it's very interesting and i really like punk music yeah a lot of the film i think was based on the q a afterwards a lot of the film was improvised which is what gave it kind of very naturalistic feeling and i think helped to have this really believable portrayal of teenagers i liked how sometimes they were doing this sort of really naturalistic chat and other times there was bits where they did the sort of the art house film thing of someone says something and someone says something else then there's a long pause sort of like sometimes i think about sheep yeah they're fluffy long pause that end of scene that's a pretty much yeah what happens in a lot of art house movies yeah i stress not a direct satire of spaceship more a satire of the whole genre but yeah there was some bits like that and other bits which were the sort of free-flowing teenage chatter bits which generally were probably the better more natural feeling bits standout performance i really liked alexa davies who played um i guess the main character lucidia the teenager who is abducted i saw her in x and y which is a film i saw two years ago at the london film festival in 2014 she's also in raised by wolves which is a very good sitcom she plays the second daughter of the family yeah i quite liked auntie vaney as the dad actually i thought he was very sort of effortlessly acting a lot of the time he was, has this sort of real presence and he or he you know seems to feel things very deeply it's always it's just enjoyable to watch yeah i think he was very good there's some great scenes when him just sort of sitting and talking to his friend who's also an archaeologist yeah no those are those are great actually there was also a bit an absolutely hilarious bit when lucidia meets this kind of soldier who's fallen out of the army kind of 
lost his way a bit. His mission in life, this soldier, is to find a cave which has a teenager in it with a disco who's going to dance until he has a vision. And I did like it that right at the end, in the kind of final montage, there's a great moment when uh, you see this soldier just walking into a cave and there's just a teenager dancing. Again, it's one of those sort of big euphoric moments that this film does quite well, is sort of combining the music and the sort of quick shots of people smiling, which did really put across the euphoria of it all. It ended really well. I, like, yeah. I think, yeah, we, we, we should end on talking about how we like the ending. <laughs> Finally this week, we'll be discussing Dead Man's Shoes, which I recommend to Nick last episode. Richard, played by Paddy Constantine, returns to his small Midlands town after being away in the army to find out that a local gang of bullies and drug dealers had been picking on his younger brother. Richard embarks on a campaign of fear and revenge against them that quickly escalates to becoming very violent. Film stars Paddy Considine and is directed by Shane Meadows of This Is England fame. It's a great low-budget British thriller and we're about to find out what Nick thought of it. <laughs> oh, OK, and this is what I tell you. Yeah, no, I really like this. It was very... It's very compact, very sort of streamlined, straight down the line plot. The it starts the you work out who everyone is quite quickly. Paddy Considine is really, really good as the sort of terrifying, intense sort of northern version of the Punisher. It was very Punisher actually. But yeah, anyway, I'll get to that. But yeah, nothing's really spoon fed, but nothing's really hard to get your head around either. You know, the characters appear, you sort of you sort of get used to seeing them, and then you realise what their relevance is. Because obviously, it's a revenge thriller, as Alistair said. It's about this bloke slowly picking off this group of people who have <laughs> abused his brother. And yeah, it sort of treads the line, but you feel some sympathy for the targets because they they are having like human reactions to it. They're not some evil gang, you know. They could, they're just a group of people who go a bit far when drunk or drunk and high, I guess. And, you know, they, they care when their friends die. They're properly terrified when this ex-military scary bloke starts just hunting them down, as you probably would be if that happened to you. The deaths are grisly, but not too. Fuck yeah! And, yeah, it's just a good film. It's a it's fairly light, I guess. I didn't really come away thinking that was incredibly dense and contained a lot of revelations, but it was a very sort of bang-on about 90 minutes. In fact, I think it was slightly less than 90 minutes. Dead short, dead tight little revenge thriller. Really enjoyed it. I'm really glad you liked it. It's a film that I really, really like, and everyone who's seen it thinks it's amazing. It's just not many people have seen it, because it's a sort of low-budget East Midlands thriller. Okay, sorry, sorry, the East Midlands Punisher, not the Northern Punisher. I stand corrected. Well, it's north relative to London. <laughs> there's some brilliant moments in this film. Like, there's a bit when Paddy Constantine, his character Richard, first appears, scares some of the gangsters a bit by kind of following them around and being a bit menacing, and then apologising for being a bit menacing in a very menacing way. <laughs> And they can tell they're all a bit freaked out by this. And then they kind of, some of the gangsters meet up to do some drugs and sort of talk in, again, a sort of slightly improvised, rambling, naturalistic dialogue sort of way. And then one of them kind of in a sort of state of intoxication leaves. They go down to the lobby of the building and Paddy Constantine's just standing there wearing a gas mask um, and banging <laughs> on the door. And it's, it's absolutely terrifying when you watch it. Yeah, you, they really get across how incredibly scared they are of Paddy Constantine, whose character's become pretty much... He's pretty unhinged at this point. I mean, the guys who he's hunting, they have done something that's pretty unpleasant and bleak, but it's not necessarily objectively true that they deserve to be systematically serial killed to death. You can tell that he sort of starts off just wanting to intimidate them a bit, but he's also not completely in control of himself and his own response, and it sort of escalates into violence on his part. You know, it's kind of as he's sort of losing control of his own emotions as well as trying to exact revenge. For those listening who have read the Punisher by Garth Ennis. It was very Punisher story by Garth Ennis. So yeah, it's it, it did feel very sort of hardline revenge thriller. Yeah, there's a couple of twists. There's one twist which I get. I guess I probably try not to spoil. Which I don't know. Retrospectively, it might have been a bit of a cheap ploy, but it was as I say, the film is so sort of lean and relatively short. But I didn't really have time to see it coming. It just sort of came and went, and I was like, oh, that makes sense. That twist is handled very well. I thought it just kind of it's executed kind of very professionally which is why i think why you you don't really see it coming it's not kind of yeah they don't really take the time to have anyone go holy shit it's like that there's no yeah it's not played as a holy balls what a massive twist we just did it's just it just happens and then you sort of gets on with it in a very matter of fact way which is very typical of this film which is one of the things that makes it good yeah like you're saying like the punisher one of the things it kind of invites you to in some way feel sympathetic for the victims or at least makes you question is richard or the punisher you know is his motives entirely pure is he motivated by revenge is he motivated by just his internal violent nature and does he in some way just enjoy being violent and the kind of the revenge is just 
an excuse he settled on. I mean, at the end of the film, so Richard starts to you know, think, oh, he's the monster himself. Yeah. And well, I don't want to spoil the actual like final moments, but he does have a kind of moment of revelation at the end when like, is he the real monster? Or is he at least as bad as the people he's taking revenge on? And I think like the Punisher, it creates this kind of what you initially view as a sort of sympathetic vigilante villain. And then invites you to question, to what degree is this guy a sympathetic villain? Should you really be rooting for him? Well, exactly. I mean, he's sort of, is he, I mean, he's not even like a villain. Is he like a sort of anti-hero or is he just a, a villain? Yeah, anti-hero, I'd say, yeah. But it, to what degree is he an anti-hero? To what degree is he a villain? Yeah, there is, as I say, it is a time to fairly bleak film. There is a sort of, a particularly during like the first two thirds of it, there is a sort of undercurrent of sort of humour. Sometimes slightly sort of deadpan or bleak humour. Mostly sort of, as you said, in the form of the targets having these sort of rambling conversations with each other or doing weird things or silly, terrifying things. And that, But that does help set off the grimness of the rest of the events. And also, much like Spaceship, there's a sort of constant background soundtrack of folk ballads, which I did enjoy. Yeah, that seems to be a Shane Meadows sort of signature in that a lot of his films have these kind of like folky acoustic soundtracks. There's a very much a Shane Meadows thing. This, that's in This Is England. It's in Dead Man's Shoes. It's in A Room for Romeo Brass, another amazing film directed by Shane Meadows starring Paddy Considine as someone who is also a bit unhinged. I liked the way it sort of seemed to exist in this weird sort of sleepy bubble. Like the rest of the town didn't seem to exist. I mean, did we see a single person? No. I think the only other time is like like right at the beginning when there's the you first meet the gangsters and one of them is is dealing drugs in a pub oh yeah there's a pub or something there's a few other people there, there's a few people playing pool but very very few i got the impression they shot this like really early in the morning it's a good way to make films because there's less people to get in the way if you shoot early in the morning but also it creates this wonderful sense of emptiness like you can be shooting a town and if you shoot like four in the end like no one's there and you know nothing's going on it's very quiet and you can get this kind of yeah this real bleak sense of emptiness that does explain, yeah, why the light's always so sort of gentle and washed out and why, it, yeah, everything always seems so weirdly quiet and desolate. But, yeah, and it does sort of work with the fact that there's there's hardly ever anyone else in shot. At no point does anyone go, could we just call the police? <laughs> you know? But, yes, yeah. we occasionally deal some drugs, but that guy's a serial killer. <laughs> yeah. But it doesn't seem to be anyone else in this world. There's no one, yeah. no one's coming to help them. It just makes it feel a bit, feel even more sort of like a focused pressure cooker type situation just this guy just yeah. hunting down these people and for whatever reason there's nothing they can do about it there's a lot of beautiful shots of the east midlands countryside as well which the the folk music goes really well with and stuff which kind of gives it a kind of gentle pace sometimes you feel like the opening strikes you is, it, is this going to be like all creatures great and small you know it's kind of like lots of beautiful shots of countryside and people sort of slowly walking across fields and then it escalates to be very violent quite quickly <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I don't know if I'd have seen the violence coming if I hadn't looked at the DVD cover, which is like a terrifying silhouette of a man holding an axe against a bright red background, which does somewhat say someone's going to get slashed. Yeah, well, that, yeah, that kind of gives it away. <laughs> <laughs> I thought Pilot Constantine's very good, because you know, this whole film pretty much hangs on his charisma, his ability to be engaging and scary, which he does really well. He does ag- aggressive and angry really well, because you know, he's not like a big guy, but he's got a lot of presence and a lot of intensity. I thought that's one of the reasons why he was very good in The Girl with All the Gifts, in that he has this kind of intensity, sort of this contained intensity and anger that's very, very good. Well, yeah, Girl with All the Gifts, he was in, well, was it a small part? He was probably the second or third lead, to be honest. But it was a comparatively small part, and he just made a lot of it. I think he, except maybe Glenn Close, he probably came out of that film best. Yeah, I thought he was very good in that film. And yeah, he's really good here as well. There's a couple of bits where he's talking to his future victims, one particular bit in a, in someone's living room, where he's like, it's one of those properly scary sort of you're talking to a terrifying person moments where you're sort of like, where the victim is sort of going, oh, so you're, you're, I'll do this and then you're not going to kill me. And then his Paddy Considine's going, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's sort of like, oh, you're fucked, mate. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that is a very good scene, yeah. It's very good. But yeah, it's, if you if you like sort of grim British thrillers, or indeed, as I say, if you do like the Garth Ennis Punisher, this is genuinely the closest I've seen to a filmed version of the Garth Ennis Punisher. There's sort of just the sort of the whole vibe of it, right down to the sort of colloquial Britishness or the useless baddies and the knob jokes. Well, that was Dead Man's Shoes. I'm really glad that you liked it, Nick. But what have you got for me for the next episode? Right. Well, slightly breaking with recommendation tradition instead of something i liked when i was a teenager or a young adult or just 
me in the past in general. I'm actually going to recommend something I've discovered quite recently, which I think you would enjoy and would quite like to talk about. It's the animated series Rick and Morty, which they have helpfully just put the first season up on Netflix, so you shouldn't need to go far to get it. It's about a sort of mad scientist and his grandson who go on adventures and as you might be able to tell from the fact that the kid's name is Morty there's an element of Back to the Future parodying going on here but the adventures are quite weird and the humour is quite silly and surreal and grim. I can't remember if how early on in the season there is so I don't know if you'll get to it but there's a quite good episode where they do a even more bizarre parody of Inception which is quite good fun. So anyway yeah the first few episodes of Vic and Morty I think they're on Netflix and then we can have a wee chat about those next episode. Oh great I'm looking forward to it. Thanks for listening to this episode of Moderate Fantasy Violence. If you have enjoyed what you've heard, then please subscribe on iTunes or wherever you get your podcasts. And while you're there, please leave us a review as it helps spread the news of the podcast. And yep, you could also go to our website, which is moderatefantasyviolence.com, which has show notes for all our episodes, downloads, and the occasional excessive fantasy violence bonus scene thingy. And you could also follow us on Twitter as at mfvpodcast or on Facebook, just sort of search for moderate fantasy violence and look for our purple circle logo thingy. So yep, I think that's the admin. Oh, we are still now on YouTube. I think you can probably find us by searching for moderate fantasy violence. And if you want to watch our episodes over a static image, then that option is now available to you. And yep, I've been Nick Bryan. You can find me on the internet at nickbryan.com, which includes the chance to buy my new book, which has now been released. It is the fourth in my ongoing crime series, Hobson and Choi, so you will need to go back and read book one and two and three if you haven't already. But then you can read book four, in which our heroes investigate the locked room murder of a YouTuber. As I say, it's been out for a week or so. It's going pretty well. I'm pretty sure it's my best one yet, he says, objectively. Check that out. And you can also follow me on Twitter as at NickMB. I've been Alistair Ball. You can follow me on Twitter at Alistair J.R. Ball. You can also find my writing on redtrainblog.com. Next episode, we'll be discussing Marvel's new film, Doctor Strange, Doctor Who spin-off Class, Ken Loach's Palm Door winning film, I, Daniel Blake, and we'll be finding out what I thought of Rick and Morty. Okay, and one last admin note before we finally sign off. Proper Marvel nerds will probably know that the film Doctor Strange is coming out on the Tuesday before our next episode is due out. So in order to get the review in, and we do want to get the review in, we're probably going to have to release the episode slightly later than usual. I'm hoping that just means like Thursday afternoon evening rather than first thing Thursday morning. But if you want updates on that on the day, I recommend going to our Twitter feed where no doubt you will be able to read my tortured updates from the editing room. So yep, we will see you a few hours later than normal in two weeks. Until then, bye-bye. Bye. Thanks for listening to this episode of Moderate Fantasy Violence. If you have... In- <laughs> did it wrong. We should just, for the, the uh, one year special, we should add it together all the bits we walk on. Blah, 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 and just like one long hour and a half long. I, just, I probably have got quite a lot of those. Actually, no, I probably deleted them. Uh, what, 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 what a shame. I've lost the humanity. We could just reproduce <laughs> them. We could sit there, and sit there and our computers go... At each other for an hour and we'll just release that. And then maybe yeah, we'll we finally get some unsubscribes. <laughs> I think, yeah, we should definitely do that. Oh, God, do you?